Carol Shelby now in the lead, car number 98, the two leader Maserati burning up the course, car number 11, Johnny Von Newman in second place, and Richie gets a car number 190, the 3.5 Ferrari in third. Uh, all turns, watch 56 for obstruction, watch 56. It's 1190, he spun out right behind the bales, I couldn't see the number on the car. Okay. Moving, moving, very, very fast, Johnny Von Newman right behind Carol Shelby. Pebble Beach was, was almost like a storybook. Beautiful scenery, just the smell of all those trees and everything so pure, it seems like. I think that's, that's what I remember, Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach was always a racetrack that we always look forward to because it, it was rather prestigious and, and a wonderful uh, venue. There was no question that the king of the racetracks in Northern California was Pebble Beach. We've got the fire truck on an escape road at six. Keep him there and tell him to stay there. Okay. Keep him there and tell him to stay there at turn six. Hold him there. Hello, somebody lost a wheel on six. Is he all right? Did he flip? No, he didn't flip. Good. Pebble Beach has grown to be uh, world renowned, but in the beginning, it, it was a glorious, beautiful place to go racing. Anybody associated with sports cars would have been at Pebble Beach. Fifty still in the lead. The smells at Pebble Beach, the smell, the feel, even the rain time was beautiful and driving around there, it's still quite like that now. But back then it was, it was stunning, it was a, a world apart from the rest of the world. The crowd was pretty huge all the way around the track, probably three or four deep, maybe ten deep along the snow fencing that would keep the cars out of the crowd. <laughs> and I mean, people were crossing the track when it, while it was going on. Pebble Beach course was surrounded by huge, what they call soft pine trees. And I can assure you that the only soft part is the first quarter of an inch of the tree. After that, it gets really hard. The, the very wealthy folks were there, even without the racing, but it was, they came out for the races in their beautiful cars. I thought there was a lot of people there. And, and of course, you, you could walk around in the forest and get pretty near the racetrack and see the action, and that's, that's the kind of thing we did. Any young kid that had a part-time job could buy himself a used car, fix it up, and go racing. When you think about the fact the first race was 1950 and how that event, Pebble Beach, evolved over the next six, seven years and how it gained national publicity and in some cases international publicity, it meant so much to the sport in terms of expanding the awareness of sports car racing. It really was the foundation of sports car racing on the West Coast because it persisted. Then it led to the point where it was recognized around the world. My neighbor had an XK120M and he walked over to the house one day, apartment, and he said, uh, you want to go to the races up at Bell Beach? And I said, what's that? Before World War II, there was very little road racing in the U.S. Most of it was in on circuits, tracks, and the big race, of course, was Indianapolis. After the war, some of the soldiers who had been in England found MGs. The MG had come out with a new car called the MGTC, and some of the guys were able to bring them over. Uh, they were very different from American cars, which were big and kind of clunky in those days. 
Uh, road racing in the United States started in 1947 at Watkin Glen. They had pretty much yearly races after that. 1954 was the last time and they, they built a Watkin Glen race course, which is still in uh, one of the major road racing courses in the U.S. now. There was a young man by the name of Sterling Edwards living in Beverly Hills who was a very accomplished pilot, which put him under the immediate wing of General Curtis LeMay in the Pentagon. And in the in three and four ensuing years, they became so close and they found out they had cars in common. And when the war was over, the, everybody went their own way. At this same time, in this 45, 46, there were half a dozen young men in Boston thinking they wanted to formulate a, a body by with which they could enjoy and preserve sports cars. When they finally got themselves a legal entity, the Sports Car Club of America. Now that they had a, a, a real core group of road racers that wanted to see this not only continue but grow, they were constantly searching for more venues. Curtis LeMay went to his peers at the Pentagon and convinced them that they could withstand the probable liability of running race cars on a on a government airport. In the area there was an abandoned naval airfield uh, north of San Francisco called Katati. It was still abandoned. It had been used by midnight drag racers and kids out there just having fun. Uh, and the SCCA took it over and it became kind of their de facto home because they had control of it. General May was a real character. He had a Cadillac car. And he set it up so we could race on sack bases. Katati is typical of airports, flat, featureless, um, not a real hospitable place, very few creature comforts. It was very casual. People would put together a race and we'd all go paint the numbers on our car and do the race and then take them off and drive home. I think it was, uh, the attraction was first to race the cars any way they could um, and obviously the attraction for people to watch um, the, these up and coming um, drivers as they were at the time. Just imagine trying to race through Golden Gate Park now uh, by going to San Francisco and saying, hey, we'd like to have, we'd like to have uh, this place closed for three days and, we'll, and we're going to bring uh, 100,000 people in and have probably 300 cars and I don't think anybody will get killed. It was just because Curtis LeMay had gotten his nose in a tent that it sort of salved all of their, all their concerns. The people who had been to races on the East Coast said, no, road races and roads go through all kinds of terrain. Sterling Edwards was very sensitive to the fact that we needed to find a place to race. Sterling was a good friend of mine and also the family. Sterling Edwards was a classmate of Jack Morris the owners of Del Monte Forest, in college. Jack Morris had ideas of, of building homes in the Del Monte Forest, so this was a natural way to promote potential construction of new homes. My brother, John Morris, he liked the idea. My father did not like the idea because he thought someone would get killed, which of course they did. Dear Mr. Fund, it is a pleasure to give you all the information we have to date on the proposed road race at Pebble Beach Del Monte Properties, California. This should easily be a national event one day. Hoping this letter gives you enough information regarding our current West Coast activities, I remain sincerely. Sterling Edwards, February 10th, 1950. So they continued to look to venues that they could rely on from year to year. One of the key movers behind this was Shell Cavalli. Shell being the MG importer was the primary source for race cars of that era, pre-1950. And the MG Car Club of Northern California was the main vehicle in which uh, events were organized and promoted. Shell uh, was, was more a, a race organizer in those days. He'd gone to Watkins Glen uh, earlier and uh, saw how the SCCA could put on a weekend event. And, uh, needed, it needed some organization, uh, the California one. So Shell organized the event and with the help of my mom, and mom was sort of the owner's club uh, representative 
for, for the our import company and, and Shell put on the on the races. Shell Cavalli, who was so active in uh, Northern California region, a terrific guy and great organizational uh, skills. Sterling Edwards and Bill Breeze were customers of my dad and uh, they had bought MGs and they were part of the MG Owners Club and uh, they knew the Morse family down in Pebble Beach and to go down there and uh, try the 17 mile drive on for, for size. I remember dad telling me a story how he went down and met with Bill Breeze and over lunch on a napkin uh, drew out the layout for the course and after lunch they hopped in a car and they went out and drove the course as, and that was going to be the first Pebble Beach road race. First they were going to use 17 mile drive and their various configurations and finally they settled on the course which revolves around the polo grounds. And designed the course. I think I was in the spring of, of 1950. So in 1950 the first uh, race was held. This was a prestigious event. You wanted to go there and you wanted to win. It was all out racing. We truly enjoyed it. I just think there's something very special about the area around Pebble Beach. The mystique of the trees and the forest. There's an, a more elevated sense than just being, you know, baking out in the sun on some airport circuits. In the beginning, you see the lineups there were a lot of MGs, some Jaguars, Allards. The Allards were tremendously powerful. The MGs weren't. The Jaguars were somewhere in between, and they could, uh, they could manage the course with competent driving. The reason that there were so many MGs at the first few Pebble Beach uh, road races is basically they were sports cars that were adaptable to be raced, but they were also fairly low priced. I think they had maybe 50 or 60 entries. They had a they had a good crowd. I think they surprised themselves. Some of the the names of race drivers who went on to become quite famous that participated at Pebble Beach are household names for most any race fan and beyond that. The first one that comes to mind is Phil Hill. Phil Hill was the winner of the very first race at Pebble Beach in a Jaguar that he had brought back from England. The XK120 was just the sleekest, newest, most modern sports car of the day. There were some others around, but this was the new lightweight foreign sports car. My dad went up to Pebble Beach having done all sorts of modifications with his friend Richie Ginther. They were both very skilled in mechanics, but the problem was the engine wouldn't start, so he had to push start the car. And he just tore off and he's, you know, going through the gears, tearing through the field. And about halfway through the race, he had actually done a great job of working his way through the field. And Richie Ginther puts out a sign as he's going by the pits that says, long lead. Well, my dad, you know, being the, the bundle of nerves and anxiety and, and, and thinking he's probably still in last place, thinks that a guy named Long is leading the race. Well, what Richie was telling him is you have a long lead, you can cool it, you know? He could handle just about any kind of car and he would do well and generally win. We raced against each other and both, and we beat each other uh, many, many times here in the States and in Europe also. The thing I remember most about the race is we were sitting in the garage the night before and he says, the ass end is coming loose all the time. I says, well, Bill, maybe if we put, if we put a little weight, if we tie a little weight in the back end. He and I took some coat hangers and put some weight in the back end of the car and he asked the races over. He said, it didn't help a damn thing. Did you know it wouldn't help a damn thing? We got to laughing about it after that. That was, that was a great race. That was a great place to race. And uh, historically, we don't have those kind of places anymore. Bill was down there an artist. And whatever he did, it was 100%. And I savor the thoughts of him every day. He was a, probably one of the greatest endurance drivers 
won Le Mans three times, was second twice, I think, and uh, he was the greatest of our era at Le Mans. As we know now, Phil had an expertise, had an uncommon ability to take a car and make it dance and talk. You know, all in all, that made for such a great win and a huge weekend for, for the both of them, for my dad and Richie. Turn one, there's a dog on the course on turn one. On turn one? Between the uh, starting point and turn one. Is it a big one or a little one? It's a large brown one, he's uh, by a tree. <laughs> Spectators are getting him. Well, the 50s were the beginning of the sports car uh, craze in this country and around the world. And uh, back in the 50s, it was very informal. You grabbed what you got and you went with it. And there wasn't a lot of money being spent like there is today. I always wanted to be a race car driver, but I didn't know how to do it, you know. Who, who knows how to become a race car driver when you're 17 or whatever. I met a guy along the way named Dave Carter, who had his father had a parts store. And uh, he and I teamed up and we, we, we built a race car together. And in those days, you know, you could just drive your car to the races. Uh, very few people had trailers. Uh, when we'd go to the races, there was usually, oh, anywhere from five to eight guys, and we'd pick up more guys along the way, and they'd, we'd rat race all the way uh, up to these uh, races. And uh, it was pretty thrilling because, you know, we were really racing on public roads at that time. In those days, you could build a car and go out and compete before the factories got into it. A lot of them did. There were Roger Barlow, uh, Ken Miles. It was kind of the glory days. It was, it was the days when if you wanted to race, you could get an MG or, or a car like an MG. And by not spending a lot of money, at least, get a car on the grid, uh, have some fun. There weren't a lot of requirements as far as uh, licensing and whatnot. If you wanted to race and, and were in good health, you could race. When you go really back in quite a, you know, quite a few generations, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, car, it was pretty, pretty dangerous. In fact, I mean, one of the main reasons I raced was because it was dangerous. You know, when you're 17, 18 years old, you want to do something crazy. So I think of Pebble Beach, I think of Bill Pollock. Bill Pollock had the best winning races around there, and I think for three or four years in a row, he always won the race from Pebble Beach. My ride at Pebble Beach really started in Hollywood, and um, I was driving a TCMG at the time, and I dropped in on a friend of mine, Al Moss, and we were just talking, and he said, by the way, there's a guy up in the Tacoma that just bought a new Allard and looking for a driver, and I said, really? So anyway, I called Carson's, he says, what kind of experience have you had? And I said, well, I, you know, and I said, I won the novice race at Palm Springs, and I did this and sat. He said, well, yeah, you had a ride in an Allard? And I said, well, yeah, he said, yeah, sort of, he said, uh, okay. So uh, there was the car, and it was absolutely beautiful. And uh, they said, well, do you want to take it out? I said, well, yeah, I think so, yeah, okay. And they said, well, she's ready to go. Well, this car is, is a fabulous car. It's got a great racing history, and uh, Pollock was a very good driver. It's fun to drive. It's, it's very dangerous to drive because the rear end flips out on you very fast. You go around a corner a little too fast and don't handle it right, and you find yourself going in the opposite direction. But uh, the sound is lovely. It's the noisiest sports car I've ever heard in my life. It's got no mufflers. It's a straight through exhaust on a big Cadillac V8. But it's a great car, fun to drive, and a lot of noise. Uh, my father had uh, a very, very hot MGTC that was well known, number 88, uh, driven first by uh, Bill Pollock and then later on by Jack McAfee. And Bill went out on the course and did some, uh, some great laps with it. And the next time he came around the pits, uh, my father was standing way out almost into the track and signaling him to come in. So <laughs> Bill, Bill came into the car. Bill was thinking, he told me later, years later, he says, you know, I thought that was it. I thought John Edgar was just going to can me then. That he, he, I was, I'd done something wrong. He didn't like the way I drove.
I was going to be out of, out of the race altogether. And when I stopped, he came over the car, didn't say a word, opened the door, the passenger side door, and pulled out from the door pocket his scotch whiskey. That's what he wanted. As soon as that was done, I was off for more practice. A name very well known, Carol Shelby, was an early competitor throughout the West Coast. Uh, he raced the first race, and I believe he was the first winner at Santa Rosa, which was actually Katati Raceway in 1957. So he goes back a long way. Of course, Carol Shelby is a, is a legend for his development work on the, the Cobra, the GT40, the Sunbeam Tiger, uh, a variety of cars, uh, and then on to a car manufacturer. Uh, I was around him quite a bit in, as he was involved in racing, and uh, I really enjoyed him. He was he was a great guy to be around, and, and 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 he was full of good ideas. You know, he had he had a lot of ideas, and and I was not surprised at all to see him uh, end up putting together that Cobra deal with Ford, and, and and he just very capable at doing those kind of things. I think the best thing that really explains Carroll Shelby is they didn't call him Billy Saul for nothing. And if you knew any history about American, uh, uh, Billy Saul Estes was one of the, the greatest Texas oil scammers in the business. And that was Shelby. He was a fabulous salesman. He could convince anybody in management that he had great ideas. And uh, he collected the best people around him and built probably the best racing team that we've ever had in America at that time. Won Le Mans, won the World Sports Car Championship, uh, a legend. My father realized that, you know, with the uh, the power that these guys were making in the old Cat Allers and some of these big American V8s, this, that the, the Jag just simply wasn't going to be able to keep up. So he sold the Jag, the XK120, and he bought a Alfa Romeo 8C, it was a beautiful car, but he sold it so he could go on to purchase uh, his next race car, which is when he started getting into Ferrari. Behind me is the 1953 Ferrari 250 MM Vignali Spider that probably is most associated to its original owner. Uh, it was purchased new by Phil Hill in 1953 and he drove it uh, up to the Pebble Beach Road Races um, that happened in April of that particular year. My understanding is that he was qualified mid-grid uh, between some Cadillac Allards and a bunch of C-types, uh, but Phil being Phil and the driver that he was, um, by about that 24 of the race, took the lead and went on to win. This being his first win in a Ferrari, um, and I think it's because of the drives in this race that uh, he became aware for the Ferrari factory and secured one of his many factory drives, which ultimately landed him the full factory drive and went on to become you know, the first American Formula One Drivers World Championship. Well, there wasn't any official qualifying per se. People just ran there and they'd stick you in line someplace where they felt you might be competitive or more or less equal with the surrounding cars. I walked over to where they said where the reception area was and uh, we went in and we said, we want to go in your race. And they said, okay, where are your licenses? We've never been in a race before. Okay, sign here. <laughs> Our entry fee was $15. <laughs> and the other thing too is it we could drive the car with it like this. Race cars all of a sudden became cars you couldn't drive on the street. You know, virtually impossible to, uh, to drive today a race car on the street, but also in the 60s or 70s. Up to that point in time, you would actually drive your car, put on a rondel, helmet if you're uh, advanced. Some guys didn't even wear helmets and you would go racing. On the qualifying of that, that day, I got, up, I got onto that back straight and there was a Morgan. And I think he was stopping to get sandwiches or something, but he was just puttering along, you know. And when I came in, like everybody's looking at their stopwatch and saying, what the hell happened? And I explained what happened. And they said, well, we're very sorry about Mr. Pollock's, uh, you know, misadventure, but 
we have a whole lot of cards that have to qualify and he can, if he will, wants to, he can go out at the end of qualifying. By now I'm a little pissed off too that I've got to wait all the afternoon and you know. So I went out and I was going to do a flying lap and I came by the start and finish absolutely full on. And just past the start and finish is this little bit of a bend. And when I got into it, I realized that I was going just about 10 miles an hour too fast. I'm feathering the brakes and I'm doing this and doing that. And it just no way, you know, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to make the turn. So when I got to the end, I just spun it and I killed the engine. And I said, well, that's it, Tom, whatever, whatever they want to do. So they put me on the pole. <laughs> now, they, they, we don't want to see that again. <laughs> This is the 1953 Tatum GMC Special. It was built in Stockton, California by Chuck Tatum. Chuck was a young man having just returned from World War II in the Pacific. He was a survivor of the first wave uh, on Iwo Jima. Well, the idea behind the Tatum Special was the fact that I'd always been interested in race cars. And I'd made, built a lot of race cars before the Tatum Special. This is a car that was, according to Chuck, uh, built almost on a bet. One time, I was at a race in Stockton, California, road race, and they had a lot of big, famous cars up there. One of them was a, called a Cadillac Allard. And that was a real fast car. Nothing, that, no one could beat it actually. He was having dinner one night with Sammy Weiss and with uh, Phil Hill and Stockton, the head of uh, the road races. Someone says, it's hard to ever beat an Allard. I said, well, I could. And they said, well, how could you do that? I said, well, I'd make a car that could outrun it. And they said, no, no, forget all that. And there was a lot of discussion. I suspect there were some jokes back and forth. And later on, a guy was one of the guys there. Says he came to me and he says, "Is that really true? You could beat a car, build cars that would beat an Allard?" I said, "Absolutely." But this is what resulted. So what do we have here? Tube frame, coilover and shock absorbers on the rear axle, all four junkyard uh, suspension components, big GMC truck motor and a beautiful aluminum body. And that is the uh, Tatum GMC Special, as it was first raced in 1953. There was a certain amount of talent that was developed just by the men being there and racing, and every race, they got better. They learn more about their vehicle, their vehicles got better, and therefore...
Nothing like that today. Absolutely different. Well-known drivers was Ernie McAfee, who was uh, working on other people's cars for quite some time. Below a large sign that was very visible, it was a turtle wax. The human sign was a turtle wax. And down below was uh, Ernie's shop. And he took care of everybody that wanted to modify. He was an engineer. He, he was a uh, first-rate mechanic. He, he competed at Bonneville, you know, and hot rods and so forth earlier on. And then when my dad uh, started Ernie McAfee Engineering, backed him. Ernie always wanted to drive sports cars, and so my dad financed his his career, started it in sports car racing in California. In 1952, Ernie entered the Mexican road race with a co-driver, Jack McAfee. They were not related. They entered and came in fifth in the Mexican road race. At some point, became frustrated being a mechanic, and uh, 1954 really decided to go racing. He raced a little bit before, but not seriously. Ernie was such a good driver, he would drive in the under three liter class in the Monza and win that, and then he would jump right into the 4-4 Ferrari into the main event and win that. And he did that a, a bunch of times. This car has a 15cc Oscar engine with twin spark. The car has a, quite an interesting history. It started off as uh, Oscar's entry in 1955 Le Mans with a driver named Gorbetti, who uh, failed to finish. After that, the car uh, came back to Italy, did a few races again as a factory car, did a few uh, things on it, and then sold it on to America. Now, the car was, at that point in uh, time, owned by the Oscar distributor um, down in Arizona called uh, Chapman. He then contacted Ernie McAfee in late 55 and said, Ernie, you anyway participate in race. How about you try to campaign this car on my behalf and therefore spread the Oscar gospel? In the 1956 Pebble Beach, he entered the Oscar MT4 in the small car race and the 44 Ferrari in the main event. He uh, did quite well, led the group, the under 1500cc on a Sunday. Then the distributor, the motor broke, he had to retire and hopped into his now infamous uh, 121 LM Ferrari. And as Jack McAfee tells it, uh, the 857 Sport of Jack McAfee was overtaken by the 121 LM of Ernie McAfee. And Jack said that he, he um, missed a shift then uh, got in the wrong gear in a corner and went straight into a tree. He just, there was never any doubt what his passion was. You know, growing up he was always cars, cars, and more cars. Jack McAfee uh, started in an MG that was sponsored and owned by John Edgar. John Edgar had this real famous MG number 88 that Ernie McAfee kept at his shop and did all the work on. Because the Edgar MG did so poorly in the first Pebble Beach race, one lap, uh, a lot of effort uh, out of Ernie McAfee's engineering uh, shop uh, went into preparation for the second uh, 1951 Pebble Beach race. When the McAfee's, Jack and Ernie, loaded the MG88 onto the trailer to take it to Pebble Beach. Uh, they got as far as the uh, ridge route. The wheel on the trailer came off and rolled down into a canyon. So there it was with a trailer inoperable, no wheel to replace it. You know, my dad was kind of asking Ernie what he, what he thought they should do. And uh, <laughs> Ernie said, well, let's, let's uh, roll it off the trailer and just drive it up there. <laughs> so. He drove the race car with the short stacks, no mufflers. Exhaust headers about this long. The loudest thing you could ever imagine from Grapevine on the ridge route all the way to Pebble Beach. He said when he got there, he couldn't hear a thing. He says it's probably one of the reasons now, which he told me a few years ago before he passed, that I don't hear too well. And he graduated to Porsches and then 
graduated from there into Ferraris. He um, had a, a fairly long career that went beyond a decade and was very successful in his, his racing. Today we're sitting in front of the 857 Sport serial number 0588 that's in the Les Wexner collection. Very fascinating history on the 857 Sport in that it was a factory team car originally given to Olivier Jean de Bienne and Mastin Gregory. Their first time out in the car during practice, they crashed the car, rolled the car. After the factory rebuild, 0588 was sold directly to John Edgar, who was a California businessman who was one of the original Ferrari race teams. Jack McAfee, driving for John Edgar's team, was terrifically successful in the 857 Sport, all the way to 1956 Pebble Beach, where he was third overall. The course itself was really interesting. Um, we got some practice. I can't remember just how much. The course wasn't too hard to learn. There were only approximately five turns that, that really were turns. Um, the changing elevation was the, the interesting part. Up at the top of the course was like a, more or less a hairpin. And then you were on a downhill section, which was quite fast. And then into the to the bottom turn, which was about a 90 degree turn, back to the start finish. It was it was an enjoyable track to drive. The thing you worry about, or I worry about, is getting through that first turn. I mean, that is the crucial thing. Getting stopped, you know, not overdoing it. It's so easy because you can't even get your right foot off the floor. I mean, you are glued all the way to the firewall and the shadows that the trees created. And then as you ran your car through the course, there was this strobe effect that was distracting to many. But if you were standing in the paddock, listening to the car going around, you could tell from the sound they made going through the tree. You could tell exactly what was going on in that car a mile away when he changed gear, when he was breaking. And of course, straight pipes were uh, the only thing. You were allowed to make as much noise as you want to. And everybody did. I wear two hearing aids most of the time. It was pretty exciting on the starting line because all our cars had to be hand pushed to start. And then they wanted to have a standing start. So everybody is sitting there with their engines running like crazy, wanting to get off the line. And uh, when we got the flag, it was a real scramble. Guys were going in all directions, it seems. And it was pretty exciting. The first time that we saw the course, here was this literal wandering path through the Del Monte Forest. Fortunately, the old corral <laughs> was there where the horses had been. You could sit on the, on the fence there and, and watch them go by on the straightaway. So you had to watch where you step when you were walking around in the pits. I must have started under in uh, Northern California, even Southern California. And uh, I remember him today with his white and uh, red uh, shirt on. He was a portly gentleman, but quite active. And he could jump like a kangaroo, and he, which, which he managed to do at the end of every race. But he also got halfway out in the race course, and, and it was sort of a challenge whether you were going to hit him or not. And uh, he wanted to be close to the car, so he was in the picture, you see, when you came across the start-finish line. But this was unnerving because he never knew where he was going to be. But he was a darn good starter. And uh, uh, when he ran from the lead cars to the back of the line, we would try to watch him come in, you know, and try to outguess him, which we couldn't do because uh, we'd be jazzing the engines and then he wouldn't do anything. He'd just stand there flat-footed and then all of a sudden he'd leap three feet in the air and we were supposed to be off. 
I had a, a good uh, a good respect for him, but uh, I think he was in the bullfighting business or something before before he uh, signed up for the sports car club. Pebble Beach was very popular because of one thing of where it was, and plus the fact that. Uh, it drew a crowd from Los Angeles as far as the drivers as well as uh, 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 Northern California. It was the first time that we'd sort of met all the guys that came up from Southern California. And they were a totally different group than the guys that raced around the Bay Area. These guys were far more professionally race oriented than the sort of the amateur gentleman racers that you found around San Francisco. These guys had a lot of hot rod background. So instead of running MG engines, they were running V860s. So there was a whole transition there that went away. The guys that came up from Southern California were a whole different kind of group of racers. And of course you had your, you know, your rivalries, but it was still, it was still something that you supported one another in. But it was getting more aggressive all the time. More competition, more money involved. People from back east were coming out. We didn't have any foreign drivers. One has to remember that we're simply, this was the fledgling moments of a new course. It didn't have the draw of a fixed, known venue. And I think that, that, that played into the fact that we didn't have a lot of drivers from the East Coast. Jim Kimberly was one of the few that made the effort. Kimberly was a hell of a good driver and he was doing well in the race until the big sweeper turned three. Uh, Jim Kimberly rolled his uh, 166 Barquetta and who was there to give him a kiss and make sure that he was uh, not feeling too bad about everything? Ginger Rogers. It was pretty obvious that the movie industry had, did not overlook the fact that we had already found these beautiful scenic places to race. The film Fast and Furious was shot there. Connie, will you give me a break? Why should I? You drive people off roads, leave injured men unconscious. All right, don't give me a break. Just remember, I've got a gun and I know how to use it. We had a shop over here on Sunset Boulevard. Ernie McAfee Engineering, and I was we'd go over there and bench race every Saturday. And one of the customers for of Ernie McAfee was Steve McQueen. So I got to know Steve McQueen and sort of the Hollywood group. I got to know Steve fairly well because I was uh, running a company then, and we had a motorcycle type machine that uh, he, he wanted to play with. Steve took one of these and, and broke it in about an hour. He was tough on on cars, I, and I don't know about girlfriends, but he was tough on cars. The nexus between Hollywood and its own aura and uh, speed, which in those periods was very much a personal thing. So, you know, you could basically buy a car, race it yourself, you wouldn't need a big team behind you. Um, became a little bit of a um, weekend hero type. And that really kind of uh, attracted a lot of machismo type. So I think, you look at all this mix and you say, you know, it was a very special time, a gilded area. Jackie Cooper was a frequent visitor to the races. It's a romantic place, I and mean, Highway 1, boy, oh boy, you know, Kim Novak lives there. That's enough for me right there. I don't even need to see her. I just know that she lives on Highway 1. All of a sudden, a guy came up and he was talking to me and he says, we're making a movie called Johnny Dark. It's about road racing. For those of you who just tuned in, we are speaking to you from the starting point of the border to border race, a three day, 2200 mile grind from Canada to Mexico. And suppose you do lose the race. Who cares? I care! We'd like to rent your car though. I said, no. I knew I had a good car and I was proud that somebody wanted me to, to be involved in it, you know? But along the way, they kept calling me up. I wouldn't know if I wanted to, if I'd rent my car. I said no. And no one had ever asked me to be an actor before. Finally, it turned out, we're sending you a contract. Where they are. Stay off the track. Johnny, the brakes went. So help me. 
Coming around that turn, I lost him. Maybe it was a brake fade. Then the brake drums would be hot, wouldn't they? Oh, you can do better than that, Duke. Forget it. Johnny, he was trying to explain. You didn't give him a chance. I gave him my car, didn't I? I thought, well, you're going to need a lot of money in life. You better make as much as you can. Liz, so I lost the race. Who cares? I care. I made about $10,000 off of that thing. Most money I'd ever made, made in my life was <laughs> screwing around with race cars in Hollywood. Pebble Beach started in controversy and it ended in tragedy. John von Neumann entered a new TD and um, he ended up winning the race with a guy named Bill Kerrigan second and another MG. And we ran three or four races together and he would win and I would win it. And it got to be a habit for him. Let's beat Johnny. He was the importer for uh... Porsche cars and came up with the first uh, 356 Porsches and nobody had ever seen anything like the Porsches you know I mean a rear engine air cooled I mean this is a total departure from our English background with the with the MGs I caught up with him on the uphill I tried to go through the turn with him so going through the turn sideways I ended up in a ditch I uh, lost a lot of ground, so I had two laps to go. By the time I got to the last lap, I had caught him. Second place for the second place. After the race, the um, SCCA disqualified him, uh, claiming that he had ethanol in his fuel. Not only that, the SCCA said that all of the entrants were required to drain their fuel before the race and refill it with the fuel at the track. Uh, John didn't do that, so he was disqualified. In the mail, a letter from one of the official sports track club of America awarding me first place. That was a surprise. I always wondered through the years if anybody ever remembered that, because I always thought I was the only one. But now recently I found out different. It still doesn't matter. Uh, I was second. Sterling Edwards bought the car new and uh, he really wanted to race it at Pebble Beach, so he entered it and Phil Remington was his mechanic. Dad went out to test the car and came in after a couple laps and, and told Phil, uh, there's something wrong with the handling of the car. So Phil crawls underneath the car for a little bit and tinkers around and sends Dad back out. And Dad came back in the next lap and said, no, there's still something wrong with the car. He says, well, take it out and see what you think of it. So I took it out and, oh, probably doing 90 or 95. And as I was coming up the hill on this Jaguar, some fellow went and dropped Jupiter. So I nailed him and then went and hit a couple of big pine trees and shortened the car up about four feet. So the guy leading the race was the other sea jag. So that guy gets a big sign, pit now. And the driver, you know, he was driver, not owner. He comes in and says, what are you doing? I'm winning the race. And the owner said, you're sitting in Mr. Edwards' car. Well, Sterling just wrote him a check and said, bring the car in <laughs> and finish the race in, in his new, new C-Jag. <laughs> it was a pretty good shunt, but it didn't damage the chassis or anything. It still had the, uh, you know, it still has the original tub, tail section, door, and the rest of it. The moment of truth is when the starter starts his run back between the cars. And that's when, you know, you, for the 97th time, you check to make sure the ignition is on. The car is in the right gear. God forbid if you had it, you know, and this is a three-speed box. When he finally came back up, 
my adrenal glands were in, in high speed and just be, when he told us to fire up, I hit the starter button and this thing just let out a boom, you know, and it actually blew a piece of asphalt about the size of a, of a salad plate up, off the, just knocked it right on the exhaust and knocked it right into the side of Michael Graham's car. And I thought, well, Kane's game is he he's out of the race right now when my exhaust <laughs> will put a dent in his car. I don't know um, how much those cars cost back then. My father didn't really have to concern himself with that. He was uh, front of the car by Chuck Hornberg. But I do remember him saying uh, the best thing was to um, actually not race your own car, race someone else's car. My dad would help us some kid with his MG while they're calling his name to ask him to come up to the start line. I remember Sarah once saying, Lou, you can help that kid after your race, so would you please come up to the line? Mr. Hill and a few other people are, would enjoy having a drive with you. Al Moss came up to me a couple of years ago. He said, you're McAfee's boy, aren't you? And I said, yeah, and he's like, uh, well, I got a story for you. He said, uh, you know, at the first Pebble Beach, my, my fan belt came off and uh, he was driving a, a J2 Allard. He goes, well, my fan belt came off and I, I came into the pits and your dad was standing there and he said, uh, you know, Jack, get a, get a screwdriver, you know, a big screwdriver. We got to get this fan belt back on. And he said, so, he goes, somehow, he goes, you know, your dad just grabbed the belt with his hands and got it around the pulley <laughs> and put it on, you know, just like that. And he goes, off I went. And he said, I'll, I'll never forget that, you know, but that, that's how casual things were back then, you know. <laughs> it was guys, you know, it was, it was drivers helping drivers and, you know, it was that kind of camaraderie that was made that era so special. So 1955 uh, was a big year for my father up at Pebble Beach. Um, it kind of was the icing on the cake, so to speak, for, for what his whole experience over the years at Pebble Beach was. That year, he decided to to not only enter you know enter the race, racing the 750 Monza for for Alan Guyberson, and it rained that year, so it was a, a very tricky race. I think it was quite a effective race car. Most most Ferraris in those early days were V12s, and and they continued with that. But but uh, during these years, they built some of these four-cylinder lightweight uh, cars, and. And they were quite good, uh, obviously, by the way that this car was able to compete over a whole year. He made an outstanding performance in that, and it just showed the, the real dominance of what the Ferrari could do on that course. And he won the race with it. And the car that Phil Hill won the 1955 race with, the 750 Monza, came into Carroll Shelby's hands the following year, and he won the race, the main event, with the same car. I've really enjoyed having it and, and realizing uh, what, what a wonderful car that uh, Ferrari makes and the fact that uh, Phil and Carol both uh, won several events in it makes it, make it and I won, I won my first uh, sports car race in it. So it's, uh, it's got a lot of history for me. It's kind of an interesting car to own still at this time in my life. Another well-known name and another Grand Prix racer um, is Pete Lovely. Pete Lovely came down from the Pacific Northwest. His first car that he drove here, if I remember correctly, was a home-built Porsche-powered Volkswagen. Special. He did quite well in that car. It had a Cooper body. It had been a former streamliner that had gone to Bonneville to set records, and they bought the car without the engine, put in a Porsche engine in it, um, and they called it a VW Porsche Special. Uh, and it was also known for its uh, short name, the Pooper. In one race, uh, he was running up front in his group when the uh, throttle spring broke. So he drove the balance of the race with one hand behind him, actuating the throttle, which was a rear engine car, and driving with the other hand, and he finished the race and, and did quite well. And Pete Lovely went on to win the very first race at Laguna Seca in a Ferrari. After Sean Von Neumann, who was leading the race in his Ferrari, kind of lost it a bit on the final turn. Beyond that, he then traveled over to Europe 
you had a Lotus Formula One car uh, as a privateer, raced in many Formula One races, came back to the United States and was a vintage racer in his in his cars and a car restorer up in the Northwest for many, many years and just passed away here recently. Skip Hudson was a teenage friend of Dan Gurney's. Um, they both got into sports car racing and while Skip Hudson was overshadowed by Gurney, as Gurney went on to international fame, he was never the uh, well-known driver that uh, some of his compatriots were always overshadowed, but a very good driver nonetheless. He loved racing and, and fast cars, I think probably more intensely than anybody I'd know. I mean, you'd get to talk to, to Skip and he'd come up right in your face and his eyes would just focus on you and he was just vibrating about it. He was so passionate about this stuff and a terrific driver and uh, he never, never made it and uh, had the chance sometimes and it just never clicked for him the way it should have, but uh, great guy, great guy. The Speedster, it's a, it's a perfect creation. It's, it's one of the most beautiful automobiles, in my opinion, that has ever been made. It's just a perfect balanced machine. And I think he, he thought exactly the same, that this car would be perfect for racing. It's compact, it's small, and it just looks sturdy in every way. Skip Hudson wanted to, he wanted to be seen by the photographers. He wanted to stand out to be able to come into the press. All the race cars was either white, red, gray, there was nothing unique to them. So he decided to put two stripes down the front, running down the back, and it did work. It, it drew the attention of all photographers. There again, is it myth? Is it a story? Could it actually be the fact that Skip Hudson was the guy who, who started the, the stripes down the middle of the sports cars that we see today? But of course, the most famous outing of my little speedster would be 1956 Pebble Beach races. And on the 17th lap, uh, Skip Hudson was maintaining first place until he lost control of Little Speedster. He crashed into some tree stumps. The left front panel was actually damaged, but it wasn't damaged enough so he couldn't continue the race. And he did. And he actually came second place in that race. He's kind of a, a forgotten race driver. And, it, and in some of the, the documents that I found that came with my car, there's something that he wrote in there, which I find actually a little bit sad that he wrote, but it's very true in anything in life. He said, if you don't come first, you're not remembered. But there again, why shouldn't he have been remembered? He was there together with everybody else. He was there to start it. I mean, who were these young guys? They were just normal guys who would jump in that car drive down to the racetrack and race. Imagining Skip Hudson being behind my steering wheel is quite a thought. It's quite amazing actually that uh, I'm over here in Spain with Danish origin of myself and I'm driving a car that used to race in America. I think that's just fantastic. Well, one of the things that was most intriguing about going down to Pebble Beach was the concours that went along with it. Of course, down there is just the who's who of beautiful, beautiful automobiles. There were a lot of socialites at Pebble Beach because they would come down for the concours. They were just starting to get interested in car racing. I think that was something new to them. It wasn't just Hollywood uh, actresses that were uh, considered, you know, you're in the rotogravure sort of thing. If if you sat at certain tables, you were you were identifiable as a, a socialite. I thought brilliantly arranged to have it coincide the same weekend as the concourse that had gone through all these years uh, after having started with the cars racing through the forest in 1950. In 1956, the racing was being canceled. The uh, concourse kept on running in its own way and uh, 
had gone through some high and low periods, but was enjoying generally a, a very, very wonderful reputation worldwide. All I remember was good picnics on the side of the track, great parties, bring your own booze. And pretty girls, oh boy. I remember the picnics much better than I do the races. Yeah, it was wonderful. You look back, you think, well, that was a time I could have died, and this is a time I could have died, and you wonder how you ever get to be 30 years old. There was a lot of questions about safety as far as um, crowd control, uh, trees. They had little, little tires and a lot of power, so they're going to be skidding all over the place. The helmets were not much than just a normal hat. They did manage to put a few hay bales on the corners, which seemed to help a bit. No place to go for an escape. They had on the right off the paddock there to start and finish. There was maybe four oh, ten feet of soft shoulder and the big pine trees are right there. So you didn't have much of an avenue of escape. It had this little fillip of danger in the background. You knew that if something went wrong it could go terribly wrong. Instead of scaring people off, many people were drawn to it because of that. So you had a, a little bit of everything in sports car racing. When the accident happened, I was, I'm sure I was following Jack McAfee at the time and did not see Ernie coming down the hill uh, until I heard the until I heard the crash. Ernie was uh, an aggressive driver. Uh, some say that perhaps he shouldn't have driven. He should have stayed with engineering, which was really his forte. But he just loved to drive. You know, his number one asset was a mechanic and fabricator. And when he stepped into the Ferrari, you know, albeit he did very well for a couple of races, but when you go to Pebble Beach and there is no room for uh, error. By now the cars were so fast on the Pebble Beach course, through the rises, past the trees and hay bales, uh, spectator fencing just, you know, a few feet away off the course. It was amazing that they didn't have an incident like that in the year or two previous, because they started having some pretty high horsepower cars on little tracks like Torrey Pines and, and Pebble Beach. And it was really a matter of time until somebody got hurt. Well, Ernie in the 4.4 that he was driving was, um, was really trying to make up and, and move up uh, on, the, on the leaders and was doing a spectacular job. He was attempting to uh, pass a car on the approach to turn six. Uh, he missed a downshift. He skidded into the hay bales and ricocheted into a tree and died instantly. Ernie McAfee was driving the car in 1956. It was damaged very heavily. The family that owned it was the Doheny family. They had retained the car after it was crashed. They thought, you know, it was on the borderline of it being destroyed, but they painstakingly spent two years restoring it, bringing it back to its original condition. It was always blue with the white stripe and number 76. It was probably a late entry, so in order to get in, they put it number two on it. That was the way that it raced at Pebble Beach in 1956. And that accident, the loss of Ernie McAfee, not only caused a restart of the race, but it caused the finish of the Pebble Beach races. They would never race there again. After the tragic death of Ernie McAfee uh, and after the restart of the race in 1956, uh, Carroll Shelby went on to win in Dick Hall's 750 Monza. Phil Hill was second, and Jack McAfee driving the John Edgar 857S Ferrari 
but wonderful looking car with a tail fin on it, was third. But that was the last of it. There'd never be any racing at Pebble Beach again. Only the time-honored and wonderful, prestigious Concord Elegance that continues to this day. Now the races are canceled. Sam Morris is very concerned. He wants this cash flow to, to continue to come on through. He, he goes to Monterey. They concur. They form a group that call themselves a sports car racing on the Monterey Peninsula, Scramp. And with the good fortune of a man named Lou Gold was, was placed as the first chief or head of Scramp. And Scramp was the group that got together with the U.S. Army, uh, who had a little bit of property there called Fort Ord. They took a corner of Fort Ord, and in, I believe it was 90 days, and for a very small sum of money, I think it was about $100,000, they built uh, Laguna Seca Raceway. So the Pebble Beach races in 1957 actually continued in name only by going to Laguna Seca as the eighth annual Pebble Beach National Championship races. In many ways, it's amazing the evolution of this. You know, Pebble Beach and some of the pioneers driving these cars, these, these heroes through the pine trees, ended up evolving into a purpose-built racetrack called Laguna Seca, and it has a world audience. The Moto GPs to the Grand Am series to some of the most prestigious series in motorsports come to Monterey County. And guess where they go now? Laguna Seca. For a long time after the end of that era, it was forgotten. And only until I would say the last 25 years has the remembrance reappeared. And it's, and it's such an interesting piece of history of auto racing. And I think it's important that we don't only focus on the guys that made first place or that were driving the more exotic cars at the time, like the Ferraris. But let's not forget the guys that came number two and they were driving under 1500 engines. And let's not forget their families out there today. Let's give them honors as well, that they were part of history. As far as uh, uh, being a gentleman's sport, I guess you could say it was. It was a romantic period of racing that uh, it's, it's, it's gone. Uh, it's, it's no longer with us. I miss that exciting time when we were all a large group of enthusiasts. It was quite a, a big thing. It was an enjoyable thing at the time, really. These are the ghosts, really, of, of Pebble Beach. I don't know how else to say it, but Nothing is really there to show you that, that these races happened. And, and I think that this was a much bigger deal than people can even fathom today. We look back at that age and every age in the past is always called a golden age, a heroic age. As a man once said, you can return to a place, but not to a time. The Cal Club days of that era are gone and it just remains in photographs, maps, and memories. The words Pebble Beach are just, they're almost magical in that this is where American sports car racing really began. It was just the magic time, you know, racing through the trees. But it all started at Pebble Beach.